Welcome back. Today, I will cover the module number 10, which is the LAN security concepts of Cisco switching, routing, and wireless essentials lecture series. I would recommend that you also watch the lectures from Cisco Introduction to Networks before you dive into this course. I will leave a link to both lecture series in the description. In this lecture, we will learn how vulnerabilities compromise LAN security. We will cover the endpoint security, access control, layer 2 security threats, MAC address table attacks, and LAN attacks. Endpoint security. Network attacks today. The news media commonly covers attacks on enterprise networks. You can search the internet for latest network attacks to find up-to-date information on current attacks. Most likely, these attacks will involve one or more of the following. Distributed denial of service or DDoS, data breach, or malware. DDoS is a coordinated attack from many devices called zombies with the intention of degrading or halting public access to an organization's website and resources. Even though in here Cisco defined DDoS attack as a halting public access, I would also say this can be, this can be used to limit access to any authorized individuals from uh, reaching a resource or website. So that could be a private access as well. So you could have a FTP file server uh, that is used by authorized individuals within your organization that is located outside of your company. A DDoS attack could actually prevent those authorized users from accessing that FTP file server. So it's not necessarily a public access to a public facing website or resource, but also private resources can be uh, also, uh, uh, you know, uh, halted by DDoS attacks. Data breach is an attack in which an organization's data servers or hosts are compromised to steal confidential information. Malware is an attack in which an organization hosts are infected with malicious software that cause a variety of problems. For example, ransomware such as WannaCry encrypts the data on a host and locks access to it until a ransom is paid. In some situations, all of these three types may be used at the same time or in a combination in order for these threat actors to uh, you know, attack your system. So it doesn't necessarily need to have one component. A threat actor can use all of these components to try to attack your LAN. Network security devices. Various network security devices are required to protect the network perimeter from outside access. These devices could include the following. Virtual private network or VPN enable router that can provide a secure connection to remote users across a public network and into the enterprise network. VPN services can be integrated into the firewall. The next generation firewall or NGFW. This provides stateful packet inspection, application visibility and control, a next generation intrusion prevention system also known as NGIPS, advanced malware protection, also known as AMP, and URL filtering. I will cover next generation firewalls in a separate lecture series uh, with Palo Alto and Cisco and some other devices. But for now, uh, you just need to know the uh, NGFW do exist as part of the network security devices for this course. Network Access Control or NAC. This is another way that you can uh, mitigate network attacks and it includes authentication, authorization and accounting, also known as AAA services. In large enterprises, these services might be incorporated into an appliance 
that can manage access policies across a wide variety of users and devices type. The Cisco Identity Services Engine, also known as ISE, is an example of a NAC device. So NAC device uh, can be incorporated into an appliance that can you know, manage all of these policies across a wide variety of users and device types. And an example of it would be the uh, ISE, uh, but however, there are other uh, organizations and vendors that provide such services and devices as well. Endpoint protection. Endpoints are host, which commonly consist of laptops, desktops, servers, and IP phones, as well as employee-owned devices, which are like bring your own device type of situation. Endpoints are particularly susceptible to malware-related attacks that originate through email or web browsing, because that's where the user interaction and human factor come into play, right? So the endpoints have typically used um, traditional host-based security features like such as antivirus, uh, anti-malware, host-based firewalls, host-based intrusion prevention systems, uh, also known as HIPS. So an host-based firewall example would be a Windows uh, built-in firewall on Windows 10 and Windows 11 services. Uh, so those operating system already have that host-based firewall, for example. So that would be the traditional method of protecting those endpoints. However, endpoints today are best protected by a combination of NACs, AMP software, an email security appliance, also known as ESA, and a web security appliance, also known as WSAs. Cisco Email Security Appliance. The Cisco ESA device is designed to monitor simple mail transfer protocol, also known as SMTP. The Cisco ESA is constantly updated by real-time feeds from the Cisco Talos, which detects and correlates threats and solutions by using a worldwide database monitoring system. This threat intelligence data is pulled by Cisco ESA every three to five minutes. These are some of the functions of the Cisco ESA. It can block known threat. It can remediate against stealth malware that evades initial detection. It has the ability to discard emails with bad links. It has the ability to block access to newly infected sites. And it can encrypt content in outgoing emails to prevent data loss. Please remember, Cisco ESA is one of many appliances that are available in the market. I will go through some other appliances such as Palo Alto in our later separate lectures. Cisco Web Security Appliance. The Cisco Web Security Appliance, the also known as the WSA, is a mitigation technology for web-based threats. It helps organizations address the challenges of securing and controlling web traffic. The Cisco WSA combines advanced malware protection, application visibility and control, acceptable use policy controls and reporting. Cisco WSA provides complete control over how users access the internet. Certain features and applications such as chat, messaging, video, and audio can be allowed, restricted with time and bandwidth limits, or blocked according to the organization's requirements. The WSA can perform blacklisting of URLs, URL filtering, malware scanning, URL categorization, web application filtering, and encryption and decryption of web traffic. Again, this is one of many vendors that provide such web security appliances. I will cover other appliances in a separate lecture series. But for this lecture series and for this course, this is what you need to know for your exams and quizzes. Access control. Authentication with a local password. Many types of authentication 
can be performed on networking devices and each method offers varying levels of security. The simplest method of remote access authentication is to configure a logging and password combination on console, YTY lines and aux ports. SSH is a more secure form of remote access compared to let's say something like Telnet. It requires a username and a password. The username and password can be authenticated locally. The local database method has some limitations, however, because the user accounts must be configured locally on each device, which is not scalable. As a result, you know, because we are configuring the user account in local device, it, they are not very easily scalable. The method provides no fallback authentication. So in other words, because it's in a local database in the local device, if there is a problem with the local device authentication or the uh, the usernames and password, there is no fallback, there is no mitigation involved in, you know, in case of a uh, database issue. On the right hand side, you see how you can configure a Cisco router with the line VTY password, as well as how you can create the SSH version 2 uh, on a Cisco router. Again, I will go through these uh, lecture uh, related labs on a separate videos and post to my YouTube channel. AAA components. So AAA stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting, and provides the primary framework to set up access control on a network device. AAA is a way to control who is permitted to access a network, which is the authentication part, what they can do while they are there, which is the auth what is authorized to access by this particular authenticated user, and to audit what actions they perform while accessing the network. Basically, you can look at the its authentication users authorized actions and see what they have done by accounting process. And we will go over them in a little bit more details in next few slides. Authentication. Local and server-based are two common methods of implementing AAA authentication. The local AAA authentication involves a method of storing usernames and password locally in a network device, such as a Cisco router. Users authenticate against the local database, and a local AAA is ideal for small networks. A server-based AAA authentication involves a use of a server-based method, which the router access a central AAA server. The AAA server contains the usernames and passwords for all users. The router uses either the remote authentication dial-in user service, also known as the RADIUS, or terminal access control um, system, also known as the TACACS plus controls to communicate with the AAA server. So you can use either RADIUS server or um, TACAS plus uh, method to communicate. When there are multiple routers and switches, server-based AAA is more appropriate because it is easily scalable. Authorization. AAA authorization is automatic and does not require users to perform additional steps after authentication. Authorization governs what users can and cannot do on the network after they are authenticated. Authorization uses a set of attributes that describes the user's access to the network. The attributes are used by the AAA server to determine privileges and restrictions for that user. So basically what the authorization is doing is, let's say you have user A and user B. So you have two users, imagine you have user A and you have user B. So both of these users may have access to your network. So the net, both of these users may have access to your networking devices. 
because it is been properly authenticated and both of them are authenticated users of that network. However, the user A is only authorized to access routers within a certain area, let's say area A, while the, uh, the user B may have access to routers from area A, B, and C. And how you can do, uh, uh, you know, how, how you can go about restricting that is by using authorization methods where the user A will have only access to router in from area A, and user B will have access to from routers from A, B, C, all the uh, items. Another example would be the user A may have access to modify uh, the basic configuration such as the host names and maybe the name of the DSCP pool, right? But the user B may have access uh, and the authorization to modify all of this, plus it can modify the DSCP pool IP address and other uh, advanced features. So basically what the authorization means is the multiple users could have authentication allowing access to these routers, but the authorization will limit that access based on what user is authenticated. So that's the difference between authorization and authentication. The reason why I highlight these examples is that the Cisco exam, both CCNA and CCNP exams, do give you some examples and ask you whether it's an example of an authentication or authorization and you should be able to separate them. Again, authorization, let authorized users access specific network systems or devices within your LAN. Authentication, make sure those authorized users have some restrictions associated with their profile so they all don't have the same capabilities even though they all have the access to the network. So those, that is a key piece of information that you should remember. Accounting. A AAA accounting collects and reports user data. This data can be used for such purposes as auditing or billing. The collected data or data might include the start and stop connection times, executed commands, number of packets, and number of bytes. The primary use of accounting is to combine it with AAA authentication. So remember, the primary use of the accounting is to combine it with the AAA authentication process. So the AAA server keeps a detailed log of exactly what the authenticated user does on the device as shown in the figure. So the figure is not here right now. So don't look at this uh, information. So I will get that figure later. So forget about that. So for this class, what you need to remember is a AAA server keeps detailed log of exactly what the authenticated user does on the device. How it look like, I will go through that on a lab video, so don't worry about that for now. And it usually doesn't show up on your exams for this particular lecture series anyway. So this includes all uh, executive and configuration commands issued by the user and all the information uh, that has been entered in that executive and configuration command modes within a Cisco device. The log contains numerous data fields, including the username, the date, and the time, and the actual command that was entered by the user. This information is useful when troubleshooting devices, but also it provides the evidence for when individuals perform a malicious act. So if you have a threat actor within your organization that already authenticated, already have permission to access your network, and they perform something that they shouldn't perform, you will be able to get that information through accounting process. x 
So the IEEE 802.x standard is a port-based access control and authentication protocol. This protocol restricts unauthorized workstations from connecting to a LAN through publicly accessible switch ports. The authentication server authenticates each workstation that is connected to a switch port before making it available, uh, you know, before making any services available offered by the switch or the LAN. So basically every single time a device try to connect to the system, so your LAN network, I mean, uh, the IEEE 802.1x standard can be used to secure that port that which the device is trying to connect to your LAN uh, by making sure that you know all the authentication information is there. With the 802.1x port-based authentication, all devices in the network have specific roles. Those roles are the client role, switch role, and the authentication server role. So in the client or supplicant role, a device running 802.1x compliant client software, which is available for wired or wireless devices. In switch or authenticator mode, what's gonna happen is the switch act as an intermediary device between the client and the authentication server. It requests identifying information from the client, verifies that information with the authentication server, and relays a response to the client. Another device that could act as authentication, sorry, authenticator is a wireless access point. So it could be a switch or an AP within your LAN that can act like an authenticator. And then the authentication server is the one that's gonna validate the identity of the client and notify the switch or the wireless access point that the client is uh, not authorized or authorized to access the LAN uh, on your network. So in here, here is a picture of that, uh, you know, example uh, shown here uh, of how 802.x works. In this picture example, we have a supplicant, so which is the client. We have authenticator, which is the switch. And we have the authentication, which is happening on the uh, server. So basically when a client connects to the switch, it needed to go through this process of getting that authentication process done uh, if you have the IEEE 802.1x standard implemented in your network. Layer 2 security threats. Layer 2 vulnerabilities. Remember that OSI reference model is divided into seven layers which work independently of each other. The figure shows on the right hand side the functions of each layer and the core elements that can be uh, exploited. So on the right hand side we have the application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer and the physical layer. And it also shows the possible exploitation, exploitation elements within those layers. So with an application presentation and session, you can exploit the HTTP, HTTPS, POP3, IMAP, etc., etc. On the transport layer, protocols and ports can be compromised. And on the, uh, I, uh, on the network layer, the IP addresses can be uh, compromised. And in data link layer, the ethernet frames can be compromised. So, the, and the final, the physical layer, the physical links can be compromised. So in this case, we are looking at the layer number two, which is the data link layer. And we will be focusing on the ethernet frames that can be compromised. So the network administrators routinely implement security solutions to protect the elements in layer three uh, up through to all the way to layer seven. So often time, a lot of security administrators will implement security from layer three and up. They use VPNs, firewalls, and IPS devices to protect these elements. However, if layer two is compromised, which is on the bottom, it's far down in the stack, what's gonna happen then all the other layers above it will be also affected. So if you implement all the security on top layers, but you didn't implement any other protection uh, on the bottom layers, 
what's going to happen is a compromise in those bottom layers going to impact all of these even though you already have the security setup up here for example if a threat actor with access to the internal network captured layer 2 frames then all security implemented on the layers above would be useless because the threat actor could cause a lot of damage on the layer 2 LAN networking infrastructure so in a lot of cases that especially in with small businesses and small offices we see that the security vulnerabilities are mitigated at the upper levels so layer 3 4 5 6 and 7 but not so much on the data link and physical side so the bottom side of the uh, this stack the reason for being that i would say the threats are more common up here than down here however the problem with this is if a threat actor with access to the internal network can capture the layer 2 frames and if they use that to you know create a problem for your network it doesn't matter whatever the security you have implemented up here so that's why the layer 2 security and even layer 1 security is very important on your uh, LAN system. So a switch attack category. So we're going to look at different types of switch attack categories, which is part of the layer 2 security threats. The security is only as strong as the weakest link in the system. So therefore the layer 2 is considered to be that weak link in most cases. This is because LANs were traditionally under the administrative control of a single organization. We inherently trusted all persons and devices connected to our local area network or LAN. However, with uh, modern day, everybody have the, sometimes the option to bring your own device and more sophisticated attacking mechanisms, our LANs have become more vulnerable to penetration. So even though in the old days, you may be able to get away with not implementing high security on your layer two and layer one level, nowadays with, uh, you know, bring your own device and other sophisticated threat actors, uh, you need to be careful about your layer two, even layer one, um, you know, of your OSI model. So, here are some categories of layer 2 penetration or attacks. Uh, so MAC address attacks, which include MAC address flooding attacks, VLAN attacks, which include VLAN hopping and VLAN double tagging attacks. It also includes attacks between devices on a common VLAN. DSCP attacks, uh, which involves a DSCP starvation and DSCP spoofing attack. Uh, ARP attack that includes the ARP spoofing and ARP poisoning attacks, address spoofing attacks, which includes the MAC address and IP address spoofing attacks, STP attack, which is including the, uh, you know, it includes the spanning tree protocol uh, manipulation attacks. So some of these have been already covered in my previous lectures as well as my some of my videos that are already on my YouTube channel. And some of these items I will go in depth in separate videos that will be posted to my YouTube channel later uh, sometime. So how can we mitigate some of these uh, switch attacks? So on Cisco devices, as well as many other vendor specific devices, you can uh, implement uh, some of these solutions to mitigate those attacks on your switches. They include port security, which prevents many types of attacks, including MAC address flooding attacks and DSCP starvation attacks. DSCP snooping, uh, which prevents DSCP starvation and DSCP spoofing attacks. Dynamic up inspection or DIA, so DAI, uh, which prevents uh, up spoofing and up poisoning attacks. IP source guard, which is IPSG which prevents MAC and IP address spoofing attacks. Again, I will go into depth of these uh, different uh, mitigation techniques when I will go through the lab lectures. For now, just know these are some of the solutions available at the layer two level. Remember these layer two solutions will not 
be effective if the management protocols are not secured. So you need to remember to secure those management protocols as well. The following strategies are recommended for securing them. They include always use secure variant of management protocols such as SSH over Telnet, secure copy protocols uh, which is SCP, secure FTP over FTP, um, secure socket layer transport, uh, so use uh, TLS, SSL, instead of just using like for example HTTP to access your system. Uh, it is also um, important that you consider using out-of-band management network to manage devices. Uh, I will go over what are out-of-band management network, uh, you know, what are out-of-band uh, service, for example, on a different lecture, not related to this lecture series, but for now just know there is such thing called out-of-band management network. Uh, use of a dedicated management VLAN where nothing but management traffic will be channeled through is also a good idea. Uh, you can also use ACL, uh, which are access control lists to filter unwanted access. Again, I will go through an in-depth separate lecture on ACLs uh, in a separate video. For now, just know that those items exist. MAC address table attack. Switch operation review. So. Recall that to make forwarding decisions, a layer two LAN switch builds a table based on the source MAC address in receive frames. We learned that in our previous lectures and if you don't remember how this works, please, please go back to one of my YouTube videos that I have already posted on how MAC addresses at, uh, tables are built, also known as the CAM tables. Uh, and um, you will have a better understanding of that uh, if you go and watch those videos on my YouTube channel. So this is called a MAC address table, but also known as a CAM table. So these MAC address tables are stored in memory and are used to uh, more efficiently switch frames. So the, instead of going looking for IP associated IP addresses and the device information and MAC information attached to it, all that binding will be, uh, you know, associated data will be you know put together in these MAC address table so that's why we use MAC address table so you can if you don't remember how those works again please go back and watch my previous videos on MAC address so MAC address table flooding so this is an issue that uh, a threat actor uh, you know this is something that a threat actor can do and that's an issue that as a network administrator, you should know how to mitigate. So all MAC address tables have a fixed size and consequently, as a result of that, a switch can run out of resources in which to store MAC addresses. So because MAC address tables have a very fixed size, you know, it could result in running out of space. So MAC address flooding attacks take advantage of this limitation by bombarding the switch with fake source MAC addresses until the switch MAC address table is completely full. When this occurs, the switch treats the frame as an unknown unicast and began to flood all incoming traffic out all ports on the same VLAN without referencing the MAC table. This condition now allows a threat actor to capture all of the frames sent from one host to another on the local area network or local VLAN. So note the traffic is flooded only within the local LAN or VLAN. So the threat actor can only capture traffic within the local area network or virtual local area network to which the threat actor is connected to. So. That's an important uh, piece of information. So this MAC address table flooding is typically an internal problem. So in this um, diagram, uh, the Cisco is trying to communicate that information to the students. So we have a threat actor that runs a MAC off attack. So MAC address flooding attack. And then the switch MAC address table get overflow uh, with that you know flooding of that information so now it can't you know just use the mac address table as a result the switch mac address table now 
not going to be used for certain routing uh, and the switching. So the threat actor now can capture the traffic of all of that information within that VLAN or the LAN associated with that MAC address table. So that's how the MAC address flooding attacks works. So how do you mitigate the MAC address table uh, uh, you know, uh, attacks? So what makes uh, the tools such as MacOff so dangerous is that an attacker can create a MAC table overflow attack very quickly. For instance, a Catalyst uh, 6500 uh, Cisco switch can store 132,000 MAC addresses in its MAC address table. But, but however, a tool such as a MacOff can flood a switch with up to 8,000 bogus frames per second, creating a MAC address table overflow attack in a matter of few seconds. Another reason why these attack tools are dangerous is because they not only affect the local switch, they can also affect other connected layer two switches. When the MAC address table of a switch is full, it starts flooding out all ports, including those connected to other layer two switches. So it's not just gonna flood the ports that are connected to end devices, but it also gonna flood the ports that are connecting to other intermediary layer, layer two switches. So to mitigate MAC address table overflow attacks, network administrators must implement port security. The port security will only allow a specific number of source MAC addresses to be learned on a port. Port security is further discussed in a different module, but for now, you just need to know the port security is a method that we can use to mitigate MAC address table attacks. LAN attacks. So there is a video called VLAN and DSCP attacks. It is a very good video that goes over some of the concepts we covered as well as LAN attacks. I have a copy of that video if you don't have access to your Cisco NetAcad or to your academic institution. I will post a link to that video in the description of this video as well as leave a card on the top right hand corner so you can go ahead and click that and watch that video to get an understanding of VLAN and DSCP attacks. So let's look at VLAN hopping attacks. A VLAN hopping attacks enables traffic from one VLAN to be seen by another VLAN without the aid of a router. So the whole point of having a VLAN or having VLAN uh, create, uh, you know, multiple VLANs on your network so that the traffic from one VLAN do not see the traffic from the other VLAN without some kind of a mechanism uh, such as a router, right? That's the whole point. The VLAN basically break down the broadcast domain. We learn about that on our previous lectures. Again, if you do not remember how VLANs work, please go back and check my previous videos on my YouTube channel and that will explain how VLANs works and how it breaks down the broadcast domain. But however, the VLAN hopping attacks basically gonna, what's gonna happen that allow the traffic from one VLAN to, uh, you know, uh, seen by the other VLAN. So in a basic VLAN hopping attack, the threat actor configures a host to act as a switch to take advantage of the automatic trunking port. And hence, you know, that can be used by this threat actor. So basically it takes advantage of that automatic trunking port feature that is enabled by default on most switch ports because switch ports use that automatic, you know, trunking mode, right? So that's how the VLAN hopping attack is established. So the threat actor configures the host to spoof 802.1Q signaling and Cisco proprietary dynamic trunking protocol or DDP signaling to trunk with the connecting switch. If successful, the switch establishes a trunk link with the host as shown in the this figure on the right hand side. So the unauthorized trunk link has been created now between the threat actor and this switch. Now the threat actor can access all the VLANs on the switch. The threat actor can send and receive traffic 
on any VLAN, effectively hopping between VLANs. So that is the process of VLAN hopping attacks. So there is such thing also called a VLAN double tagging attacks. A threat actor can um, have a situation where a, a that could embedded a hidden 802.1q tag inside the frame that already has a 802.1q tag. So basically a threat actor in a specific situation would be able to hide its own 802.1q tag within the frame that already have a 802.1q tag. This tag allow the frame to go to a VLAN that the original 802.1q tag did not specify. So how it works is in step one, the threat actor send a double tag 802.1q frame to a, the switch. The outer header has the VLAN tag of the threat, act, threat actor, which is the same as the native VLAN of the trunk port. So in step two, the frame arrives on the switch which look at the first four bytes of the 802.1q tag, the switch sees the frame is, de uh, you know, destined for the native VLAN. The switch forwards the packet out all native VLAN ports after stripping the VLAN tag. The frame is not re-tagged because it is part of the native VLAN. At this point, the inner VLAN tag is still intact and has not been inspected by the first switch. Remember, there's now two tags in here, right? So that's why. So in step three, the frame arrives at the second switch, which has no knowledge that it was supposed to be the native VLAN because of that second tag. So the native VLAN traffic is not tagged by the sending switch as specified in the 802.1q specification. The second switch look only at the inner 802.1q tag that the threat actor inserted and sees that frame is destined to that targeted VLAN. So the second switch sends the frame to the target or floods it, depending on whether there is an existing MAC address on the table entry for that target. So this is basically having two tags of 802.1q which is called uh, known as the VLAN double tagging attack. So a VLAN double tagging attack is unidirectional and works only uh, when the attacker is connected to a port residing in the same VLAN as the native VLAN of the trunk port. The idea is that double tagging allows the attacker to send data to host or receive on a VLAN that otherwise would be blocked by some type of access control configuration. Presumably, the return traffic will also be permitted, thus giving the attacker the ability to uh, communicate with device on devices on normally blocked VLAN. So as a result, what happened is the attacker may not have access to other blocked VLAN, but as a result of VLAN double tagging, it allows the attacker the ability to communicate with devices that are on those blocked VLANs. So how can we mitigate VLAN, uh, you know, uh, double tagging? So VLAN hopping and VLAN double tagging attacks can be prevented by implementing the following trunk security guidelines as discussed in a previous module. So we have went through that uh, in my previous lectures. You can go ahead and check my YouTube videos again on those, uh, you know, uh, options that I have discussed in detail. They include the disable trunking on all access port, disable auto trunking on trunk links so that trunks must be manually enabled. Be sure that the native VLAN is only used for trunk links. So those are some three types that three ways that you can mitigate those VLAN, uh, you know, double tagging attacks as well as VLAN hopping attacks. So 
let's look at the DSCP messages and how that can be also used for, you know, DSCP can be attacked, uh, you know, with a new network. So DSCP service dynamically provides IP configuration information, including IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, DNS servers, and uh, some other information to the clients. A review of sequence of the DSCP message exchange between the client and server is shown in this figure. So in my previous lectures, I discussed about DORA process. Remember DORA, discover, offer, request, and uh, acknowledge, DORA. So this is that process that the Cisco is trying to you know, give you a refresh on. So we already cover how DSCP works on our previous lectures, and this is just to give you a refresh of you know, how the DSCP process works. So we have a discover message, which is a broadcast message. We have an offer message, which is a unicard message. We have a, a request message, which is a broadcast message, and we have a acknowledgement message, which is a unicast message. So we have messages sent between the server and the client during the DSCP DORA process. So how the DSCP attacks work is that there are two types of uh, major uh, DSCP attacks. Uh, one uh, is called the DSCP starvation attacks and the other one called the DSCP spoofing attack. So DSCP starvation attack, uh, the main goal is, uh, is to create a DDoS uh, for connecting clients. So DSCP starvation attacks required an attack tool such as Gobbler, uh, where Gobbler has the ability to look at the entire scope of uh, leasable IP addresses and tries to lease them all at the same time. Specifically, it creates DSCP discovery messages with bogus MAC addresses so that your DSCP server will be keep issuing those IP addresses from your pool until it's run out of the IP addresses. So basically the whole goal of this attack is to create a type of D DDoS, or, sorry, DOS, a distributed, um, you know, denial of service or denial of service attack by connecting to your DSCP server and taking out all the IP available IP address within that pool. So it's a type of denial of service attack because then the next your legitimate clients come in and request for a DSCP IP address, they will be denied that service, denied that IP address because now the pool is completely exhausted. The other one is called the DSCP spoofing attack. This occurs when a rogue DSCP server is connected to the network and provides false IP configuration parameters to legitimate clients and then a rogue server can uh, provide a variety of misleading information that includes the wrong default gateway, wrong DNS server, and wrong IP addresses. And then the attacker can use those rogue information to uh, spy on your network, you know, basically snoop uh, all the data from your network. So the wrong default gateway, um, that will be an invalid gateway or an IP address that is a host uh, you know, uh, it host creates a the, to get that man in the middle attack going. So basically, when you connect to your corporate network or office network, instead of you are getting a, a default gateway associated with your secure corporate network, you're gonna get the default gateway of that threat actor. Now that threat actor have access to your information. The wrong DNS server is a rogue server that provides incorrect DNS server addresses pointing the user to a malicious website, for example, or malicious DNS server that again can be used to spy on you, basically, you know, steal your data that could uh, be used by a threat actor uh, to breach uh, data. The wrong IP address, uh, basically the rogue, uh, rogue server will provide an invalid IP address, effectively creating a DDoS attack on the DSCP client. So there's a video uh, available on your Cisco Netacad uh, called ARP Attacks, STP Attacks, and CDP Reconnaissance. If you have access to the Cisco Netacad, please go ahead and watch that video there. If you do not, I will find a copy of that video and post to my YouTube channel. I will leave a link 
to that video in the description of this video as well as leave a card on the top right hand corner so you can go ahead and click and watch that video again i would recommend you go through these videos and watch them as you go through this lecture because that will enhance your understanding about uh, the topics that we have covered up attacks host broadcast up request to determine the mac address of a host with a destination ip address all hosts on the subnet receive and process the ARP request. Remember, this is because ARP is a type of, uh, the ARP request is a type of broadcast message. So it goes to everywhere, right? If you don't remember how ARP works, again, there is another video that I have posted on my YouTube channel. You can go ahead and watch that. The host with the matching IP address in the ARP request, then send an ARP reply. So remember that host broadcast up request to determine the mac address to everybody in the network until the um, host with the matching ip address in the app request send an app reply a client can send an unsolicited app reply called a gratuitous app other host on the subnet store the mac address and ip address contained in the gratuitous app in their app tables. An attacker can send a gratuitous app message containing a spoof MAC address to a switch and the switch would replace its MAC table accordingly. So basically the CAM table or the MAC table in that switch gonna get updated with that incorrect or fake MAC address information. In a typical attack, a threat actor sends unsolicited app replies to other hosts on the subnet with the MAC address of the threat actor and the IP address of the default gateway, effectively setting up a man in the middle attack. So the, this app attack is a type of a man in the middle attack. There are many tools available on the internet to create app man in the middle attacks. The IPv6 uses ICMPv6 neighbor discovery protocol, or ND protocol, for layer two address resolution. IPv6 includes a strategy to mitigate neighbor advertisement spoofing, also known as a NAP spoofing, similar to the way IPv6 prevents a spoof app reply. App spoofing and app poisoning are mitigated by implementing dynamic app inspection, also known as DAI. Address spoofing attacks. IP address spoofing is when a threat actor hijacks a valid IP address of another device on the subnet or uses a random IP address. IP address spoofing is difficult to mitigate, especially when it is used inside a subnet in which the IP belongs. So in other words, if the spoof IP address is within the same subnet and also sometimes the same the DHCP pool, it's really hard to identify that uh, the spoof IP address. The MAC address spoofing attacks occurred when the threat actor alters the MAC address of their host to match another known MAC address of a target host. The switch overwrites the current MAC address table entry and assigns the MAC address to the new port. It then inadvertently forwards frames destined for the target host to the attacking host. So in other words, they take up those uh, addresses from let's say from a server and the threat actor now has those addresses assigned to him or her that you know is trying to get access to your system and the you know because the mac address table now being updated with that attacker's information what happened is a switch will overwrite that current mac address table entry after that over writing the, of that the so we start forwarding all the data that's supposed to go to that correct user to that uh, you know threat actor when the target host send traffic the switch will correct the error realigning the mac address to the original port 
To stop the switch from returning the port assignment to its correct state, the threat actor can create a program or script that will constantly send frames to the switch so that the switch maintain the incorrect or spoof information. So remember the MAC address table or the CAM tables always get updated, but the threat actor can, you know, prevent that from happening by you know creating a program or a script that will constantly send the frames with his fake information associated with that MAC address so that the table the, the device doesn't have the opportunity to correct itself. There is no security mechanism at layer two that allows a switch to verify the source of a MAC address, which is what makes it so vulnerable to spoofing. So there are no mechanism we can use to prevent uh, you know, MAC address spoofing, for example. IP and MAC address spoofing can be mitigated by implementing IP source guard or IPSG, um, and that would be a one way to try to prevent this from happening. STP attack. Network attackers can manipulate the span entry protocol also known as STP, to conduct an attack by spoofing the root bridge and changing the topology of a network. Attackers can then capture all traffic for the immediate switch domain. To conduct an STP manipulation attack, the attacking host broadcasts the STP bridge protocol data units, which are known as BPDUs, containing configuration and topology changes that will force spanning tree recalculations. The BPDU sent by the attacking host announce a lower bridge priority in an attempt to be elected as the root bridge. Remember how BPDUs work? Well, if you don't, there is a lecture on STP and how it works and how BPDUs are used on my YouTube channel. Please go back and watch that and that will explain how important the BPUDU messages in STP process. So this STP attack is mitigated by implementing BPDU guard on all access ports. BPDU guard is discussed in more detail in a different lecture in this course. So I will post that lecture later sometimes next week. CDP reconnaissance. The Cisco Discovery Protocol, also known as CDP, is a proprietary layer two link discovery protocol. It is enabled on all Cisco devices by default. Network administrators also use the CDP to help configure and troubleshoot network devices. CDP information is sent out CDP enable ports in periodic unencrypted, unauthenticated broadcasts. So remember, that's a key piece of information. The CDP information is sent out. CDP enable ports in periodic, unencrypted, unauthenticated broadcast. CDP information includes the IP address of the device, iOS software version, platform information, capabilities of the device, and the native VLAN. The device receiving the CDP message updates its CDP database. To mitigate the exploitation of CDP, limit the use of CDP on devices or ports. For example, disable CDP on edge ports that connect to untrusted devices because there is no need for them to have that information. To disable CDP globally on a device, use the no CDP run in the global configuration mode. To enable CDP globally, use the CDP run on the global uh, configuration mode. To disable CDP on a port, we can use the no CDP enable within the interface configuration. To re-enable it, we can run the CDP enable within the interface configuration. Please note the link layer discovery protocol, also known as LLPD, is also vulnerable to reconnaissance attacks. Configure no LD LLDP run to disable LLDP globally and to disable LLDP on the interface, what you're gonna do, you go into the interface configuration mode and run no LLDP transmit and no LLDP receive. And that would complete this module. 
And now we will look at what we have learned as a summary. So in this lecture, we learn endpoints are particularly susceptible to malware related attacks that originate through email, web browsing, such as DDoS, data breaches and malware. These endpoints have typically used traditional host-based security features such as antivirus, anti-malware, host-based firewalls, and host-based intrusion prevention systems. Those include things like you know, Windows Firewall, for example. Endpoints are best protected, however, by combination of NAC, host-based AMP software, and email security appliance, also known as ESAs, and a web security appliance, also known as WSAs. We learn AAA controls, who is permitted to access a network, which is the authenticate part, what they can do while they are there, which is the authorized part, and to audit what actions they perform while accessing the networking network, so which is the accounting part. So the AAA servers and AAA systems will use authenticate, authorize, and accounting in the uh, implementation methodology. We learned the IEEE 802.1x standard is a port-based access control and authentication protocol that restricts unauthorized workstations from connecting to a LAN through publicly accessible switch ports. If a layer two is compromised, then all layers above it are also affected. Remember, we learned that the layer two is pretty low on the stack on the OSI model. So if the layer two uh, get affected, it's gonna impact everything else above it. Unfortunately, nowadays, most people think about the security in upper layers, but not so much in layer one and layer two, but it's very important you secure those as well. So the first step in mitigating attacks in layer two infrastructure is to understand the underlying operation of layer two and the layer two solutions. We learn about the port security, DSCP snooping, DAI, and IPSG. This won't work unless the management protocols are also secured at the same time. We learn the MAC address flooding attacks bombard the switch with fake source MAC addresses until the switch MAC address table is full. A VLAN hopping attack enables traffic from one VLAN to be seen by another VLAN without the aid of a router. Remember the whole point of creating VLANs is to divide the broadcast domain and the VLAN hopping attacks basically, uh, you know, make it uh, so that the one VLAN can see the data from the other VLAN. A VLAN double tagging attack is unidirectional and works only when the threat actor is connected to a port residing in the same VLAN as the native VLAN of the trunk port. We also learn VLAN hopping and VLAN double tagging attacks can be prevented by implementing the following trunk security guidelines. They include the disabling trunking on all access ports, disabling auto trunking on trunk links so that trunk must be manually enabled. We also learn you can uh, make sure that the native VLAN is only used uh, for trunk links. We learn two types of DSCP attacks uh, that can be uh, you know used by a threat actor. They are the DSCP starvation and DSCP spoofing, and both attacks are mitigated by implementing DSCP scooping. We learn about the ARP attack, which is a situation where a threat actor sends a uh, bad ARP message containing a spoof uh, MAC address to a switch and the switch update is MAC address table accordingly. Now the threat actor sends unsolicited app replies to the host on the subnet with the MAC address of the threat actor and the IP address of the default gateway. App spoofing and app poisoning are mitigated by implementing DAI. We learn about the address spoofing attack where IP address spoofing is when a threat actor hijacks a valid IP address of the another device on the same subnet or uses a random IP address within the same subnet or the DSCP pool. The MAC address spoofing attacks occur when the threat actor alter the MAC address of their host to match another known MAC address of the target host. 
We also learned that the IP MAC address spoofing can be mitigated by implementing the IPSG. We also cover the STP attacks, uh, which is in a situation uh, a threat actors manipulate STP to conduct an attack by spoofing the root bridge and changing the topology of the network. Again, if you don't remember what is a root bridge and how the STP works, there is a video posted on my YouTube channel. You should go ahead and watch that before you move forward with my future lectures. Threat actors make their host appear as root bridge, therefore capturing all traffic for the um, uh, intermediate uh, switch domain. The sorry, immediate immediate switch domain. This STP attack is mitigated by implementing BPDU guard on all access ports. CDP reconnaissance. Uh, we learned that the CDP information is sent out. Uh, CDP enable ports in periodic encrypt, unencrypted broadcast uh, messages. So when the, whenever the CDP messages is sent out, it, they are periodic and they are unencrypted broadcast messages. So the CDP information do include uh, critical data that uh, like such as the IP addresses of the device, iOS, software version, platform capabilities, and native VLAN information. So the device receiving the CDP message updates its CDP database, and the information provided by the CDP can be used by a threat actor to discover network infrastructure and vulnerabilities because it's containing that uh, information such as the IP address and iOS software version and etc. So to mitigate this problem, uh, we uh, can use the uh, limitations on where we use the CDP on our devices and ports. Again, I will go through some of these uh, examples in details in my lab demonstration in the future. But for now, uh, just understand the theory behind all of these concepts. And that would bring us to the end of this module. If you like these type of lectures, please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions concerning any of the topics that we have covered in this lecture or any other lectures, please do not hesitate to reach out to me through either my website or by leaving a comment on one of my videos. Good luck with your exams and until next time, have a nice day.